So uh, how many of y'all are old enough to recognize this particular image? Can I get a show of hands? Uh, we had a, a random discussion in a private Slack room recently uh, assigning Mac admins the personality of Muppets, and I ended up taking Rolf the dog. Um, <laughs> It uh, turned out that uh, it seemed like the line, take myself for a walk and go to bed, was one that sounded like something that I would say in casual conversation. <laughs> you know. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to fidget a lot up here, apparently. Um, my name is Welcome to Roaming Revisited, uh, Wi-Fi Client Mobility 2023. Uh, a lot of you have met me before. I'm Chris Daw. How many folks were here uh, yesterday? OK, about half. Great. Thanks for coming back. Uh, welcome to the rest of you. I am a Seattle-based consultant who specializes primarily in Mac OS, iOS deployment, IT planning, and networks. I am a Mac Admins Foundation board member, uh, also a counterfeit extrovert, which means that I have put a lot of energy into being here. And I will be taking a long rest on the flight back to Seattle this weekend. Um, I am CT Daw on the Mac Admin Slack. Uh, you can find me on Mac Admins Foundation, Cascadia, uh, which represents the Pacific Northwest, um, and especially Wi Fi and network nerdery. Um, we're here for a couple of reasons today. We're essentially remounting a talk that I did a few years ago, right before the pandemic hit. Um, first of all, the topic of Wi Fi roaming, if you hang out in network nerdery or if you hang out in Wi Fi, um, in the Slack channels, um, kind of an evergreen topic. It's something that people find a little bit diff difficult to. Um, you know, understand how Apple creates its rules for behavior and how systems follow their rate, their rules for behavior. It frustrates a lot of people. Um, the subject of roaming and the concept of the sticky client pushes a lot of people into very dark corners with some very foul language. And I really want to kind of revisit the topic and demystify it. Um, second of all, some pretty significant things have changed since the last time we did this talk that I'll get, get into. And they have specifically to do with roaming support in specific Apple hardware. And we'll talk about that. There are a lot of things that I talked about in 2019, I think, that have changed. Um, and then third, when I developed and delivered this talk in 2019, there were some pieces of it that I wasn't very happy with in the end. We spent a lot of time going through the excruciating detail of roaming. And because of the time constraints, I ended up having to kind of downplay some of the discussions of recommendations, opinions, how do I deal with that? And I decided I wanted to, to kind of revisit that a little bit more um, because in the previous version of the talk, I felt like that particular portion of the discussion was something we almost glossed over um, just because so much material, not enough time. So I kind of pulled back a little bit of the technical discussion, some of the excruciating detail, um, hoping we can get a little bit more to um, details. One of the things that I'll do, since this is um, kind of a lot of information dump in terms of this talk, is something that I figured out yesterday, and it's taken me years to figure this out, is taking questions between sections for two or three minutes is a good way to kind of break up the tedium and kind of the, the, the overall flood of information. So the agenda for this talk, we're going to talk broadly about five things. We're going to talk about roaming basics. What is roaming? Why is it important? Um, we're going to talk specifically about Apple device roaming and the rules that Apple documents for Wi-Fi device roaming, um, which is going to be fun and interesting. We're going to talk about advanced roaming technologies that are being used to supplement client roaming in various amendments to the 802.11 standard. Um, we're going to talk about some sharp corners, that is the places where you um, sort of assume that you know what you're doing and then you bang your shin on the table and you're kind of done for the day. Um, and then finally, we'll come to some opinions and recommendations. And this conversation does go far, far, far into the weeds. Um, and so it's, it's, it can be arcane, it can be frustrating. Um, even revisiting it over and over again, I find it difficult to get the vocabulary right because it is a relatively technical vocabulary. So Wi-Fi roaming basics. First of all, what is it? Um, it turns out 
that there's not necessarily a clear and universally accepted definition. I was on the Wi-Fi wi Slack. Um, Wi-Fi community has its own Slack. I was on that Slack a few weeks ago saying, so what do we take as the accepted definition of roaming? And the answers that I got back were, there's not really one. Um, each person has kind of their own interpretation. And then I started digging through some of my CWNA study guides and uh, certified wireless design professional study guides. And I found a couple of things that were useful in the uh, exam prep guide for the older certified wireless network administrator 106. There's a section on troubleshooting roaming. Um, and certified wireless network Administrator 107 guide includes a section called Roaming Design that somehow didn't even manage to make it into the book's index. I just had to leaf through and find it. Um, it was a little bit accidental. But both of those guides gave a description saying that roaming is effectively the method by which client stations move between RF coverage cells in a seamless manner. And so we're gonna take that as our jumping off point. Um, if we were to take that phrase and sort of build a list of criteria defining roaming, we start with the idea that a wireless client starts associated to a network via a particular access point or basic service set, if you will. The client then, for some reason, moves its association to a different access point in the same network and in doing so maintains its connections and its sessions so that things like video calls don't get dropped, voice over IP calls don't get dropped, uh, your application sessions continue to work. This is how we're gonna to talk about this in terms of criteria. And when you do this in Mac OS, it looks a little bit like this. Yeah, yeah, you don't see anything, nothing happens <laughs> visually. There's no <laughs> obvious clue that this is going on. There are places and logs to look for it. If you are using diagnostic tools, um, you can see it happen and you can set yourself up to receive notifications when it happens. Here's a little bitty short video that I took in Wi-Fi Explorer roaming between the two access points in my house in Seattle. Um, this is gonna be very subtle, so watch the bold black text and look for the moment that the bold black text switches between the mezzanine access point and the third floor access point. Did we start playing? Yes, we started playing. So just beat, 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 jump. You know, and this is something that I happen to be able to see because the Wi-Fi Explorer Pro application shows me what network I'm associated to on my client. This isn't something that's built into the operating system. And it's not even really something that's designed for general user interface work or user notification. If you want something like that, the developer of Wi-Fi Explorer Pro also has a tool called Wi-Fi Signal that I think is a little three or four dollar menu item edition that will log certain types of events on your Mac and give you kind of exportable logs, give you um, a bit of an audit trail in terms of what's happening, and it will also allow you to show notifications that you've roamed from cell to cell. There's a growing number of Mac-friendly tools um, that will help diagnose some of this stuff. One of the things that's most interesting and most exciting, in which I have not had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with yet, is a tool from a British company called InOversight, um, which in its current incarnation feeds information from iOS devices that are moving around a facility to a host Mac and allows you to essentially pull logging information from those devices. They currently have a Mac OS version of this in beta, so you can see roaming events, roaming criteria, things like that pop up. Um, and this is something that if you are interested in this particular topic, interested in this process, doing network administration, this might be a good tool to get a hold of. But coming back to the specifics of the process, um, there's essentially kind of a step-by-step -step in which Wi-Fi clients maintain a list of access points that they know about because they're constantly listening to the network. Um, they're occasionally probing. Um, and it keeps a list of the access points that it's heard about or that it thinks are in range just during the course of normal operations. 
At some point, a client then uses a proprietary metric to determine that it should attempt to find a better connection. Keep in mind that metric is proprietary. It varies from vendor to vendor. The client checks its list of candidate access points, might scan again to verify their availability, and then it chooses a new access point and attempts to roam. And implicit in all of this, and really key to this discussion, is that it's the client that makes the decision to roam. It's so usually, again, based on a proprietary set of metrics specific to the vendor. Um, we're going to see that larger enterprise-grade networks can influence this a little bit, but to this point, it's still the client that's making this decision and attempting to execute. If you really want to get into the weeds, you can see the transactions and the traffic necessary to execute a roam if you run a certain kind of packet capture. Um, this couple of slides shows essentially four frames in two exchanges. One is an association request and an association response that is a client joining a network. That's the first two frames in this list. Um, the third and fourth frame show what is called a reassociation. And the third line shows the client sending a reassociation request to a second access point, essentially saying, hey, I want to be over there. Um, the information field that I've highlighted over to the right saying reassociation request is an easy way to pick out that this is a roam attempt. And this is a, this is a Wireshark visualization, by the way. Um, Looking over to the right, you can see that the client was originally on channel 48, but it sends its reassociation request to an access point on channel 165. Um, you might be wondering how I captured this. This is multiple machine captures combined into a single file, because you can typically only capture on one channel at a time. Um, and finally, at the bottom of the window, the content of the reassociation request includes information from the client telling the room candidate access point which access point we're coming from. Because one of the things that happens in the back end is potentially transitioning cached information about sessions from access point to access point. And then the fourth frame of the capture, the access point that the client attempts to roam to, sends a reassociation response back to the client with a status of, yes, successful, you can come over here and you can be associated to me. That allows the client to switch its connection. Why do we care? Why is this important? Um, I've recombined the number of reasons several times, depending on how granular I'm feeling moment to moment. Um, because it is kind of complicated and you can do, and well, there's nothing more that network people love than hair splitting, right? Um, now that we understand what it is, we want to understand why it's important. The first reason that it's important is client connectivity and c connection performance. Essentially, we want our client devices to stay connected to the network, and we want them to have acceptable performance. One of the things that happens as a Wi-Fi client moves away from its associated access point is that as the distance, distance increases, the quality of the signal degrades to the point where the negotiated transmission rate may be too low for the client and the access point to send enough data to maintain a connection. This is where you might get something like um, you know, jittery dropouts in your voice calls, or um, sort of weird artifacts in your video calls, or dropouts in your video calls. Um, and what we want is we, we want the client to move to a new connection to have a stronger connection for its own sake. But there's a second reason for this, um, and it gets into kind of the nature of Wi-Fi and the way that Wi-Fi works in ways that are different from the way that Ethernet networking works. In Wi-Fi, you essentially have a medium that all of the devices in a cell contend for. That is, one radio effectively can transmit at a time and be heard. If more than one radio transmits simultaneously, there are collisions and everybody has to back off and resend. Um, and in that environment, a client with a slow connection uses more time to transmit the same amount of data as clients with fast connections. And the clients that are associated with an 
access point that have a fast connection negotiated, they basically have to sit there and wait for the slow client to finish sending its data. And so really what you want is you want your clients to roam in order to provide aggregate network performance. And this is something that's a little bit of a weird concept that it's, I find it incredibly hard to grasp. We don't necessarily want to think about Wi-Fi performance in terms of I have one client and one access point and they've negotiated a 500 megabit connection or whatever. You know, that's all well and good. It doesn't tell you enough about what's actually happening because the real key is the number of clients in the cell who are attempting to transmit and receive um, within that given cell because that slices up the amount of time that's available for everyone to transmit um, and kind of kicks that issue of bandwidth over to the side. Air timers are a real problem. And if you have a so slow client monopolizing the air time on an access point, you're essentially degrading the experience for everybody who has a fast connection. So, questions about this so far? And we're gonna remember the catch box and I'm gonna try to actually hit the targets with the catch box today, because that's been an issue so far. Um. You talked about the list of access points that a client maintains. Is that something that you can, you have any visibility into, any capability to control? To my knowledge, no. One of the reasons that I'm very interested in playing with the N Oversight tool is because the N Oversight tool is surfacing more logging information that may not be obvious. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of it so far, but I don't want to treat that answer as authoritative because I've come to some of these new tools kind of late. I haven't been paying as much attention as I should have. There may be something there, um, but to my knowledge from a, an end user perspective or an administrator perspective on the client side, the answer is no. Other questions? Back in the back? Uh -oh. Where? Careful. Got it. <laughs> Hi. So first thing first, I love your t-shirt. I want one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I just wanted to add on to the last question. And the question was on like maintaining the list uh -huh. of the devices. Uh, so there is a free uh, software which comes on Mac itself, which is called Wireless Diagnostics. Uh -huh. So if you open that, Yep. You see a window. In that, you see an option of scan. Yep. And I think that what the so so what um, you're saying is that wireless diagnostics will allow you to kind of scan the network. And I think that and that what I'll have to look at it because I haven't looked at it in a little bit. Um, but what I think that wireless diagnostics is showing you is is kind of a scan of what's available when the computer goes out and try tries to talk to the network and say, hey, what's out there? And I think that the question that I'm getting from John is a question about can we review that data in logs and understand what the computer understands without it having to scan. So I think that's the distinction I'm making. But yeah, that's an sure, excellent sure. point. Thank you. No, 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 thank you. No, I just like, because you made a point that there could be something, so uh -huh. I just like wanted to add, that's it. Okay, yeah, thank but, you. But yeah, this is going great. I'm learning so much, thank you. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Anybody else? Hey, let's try a relay. So I was in your previous session, and I'm trying to think back to if you, about um, Wi-Fi 6E, right? Um, trying to remember back if you talked anything about roaming and anything related to Wi-Fi 6E and roaming. Is there any I, I haven't that? yet for a couple of reasons, and we are so going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's actually, I mean, that, that sounds ominous. It's not as ominous. It's more of a case of there's a gap in the documentation that we'll talk about. <laughs> so, um, you know, and it, again, with, with respect to our conversation from yesterday, Wi-Fi 6E is relatively new. And um, especially, you know, by the standards of network hardware generations, um, at least Apple has really only gone to 6E, I think, since October of last year. And Apple tends to put stuff out onto the market and then document gradually over time. Um, so speaking of Apple device roaming, let's 
now that we've, we've justified um, the importance of roaming and kind of given ourselves a definition, let's talk about how Apple devices roam. Um, Apple provides documentation for Wi-Fi roaming differentiated by two broad categories of device, and they have separate knowledge base articles describing each of those. Um, Apple went out of their way to document uh, iOS and iPad device roaming initially in 2014 and then came along in 2016 and gave us a document describing macOS roaming. Um, these should have active links in the slides, so you don't necessarily need to write these articles down, but um, those exact titles are an excellent way to Google for the specific articles. Um, the processes for the two platform collections um, are similar but different enough to warrant separate discussions. Um, but one thing is true of both category of device, which is Apple devices use uh, the received signal strength indicator reading as a threshold to trigger roaming. Um, and what that means, RSSI is essentially a measurement that the client takes of relative signal strength from its associated access point um, that is characterized um, in usually a negative integer value, negative 40, negative 50. Um, you know, the unit is decibel milliwatt, so we see it as dBm. A Mac OS device will trigger its roam threshold at negative 75 dBm. Um, that means when a Mac reads its RSSI as NEG75, it starts a process to attempt to roam, and it uses the criteria as follows. And I'm going to go through these one at a time because they, they run together, they're a little complex. I had them all on one slide last night, and I looked at that and went, please, no. Um, <laughs> so rule number one is that macOS is going to prefer a 5 gigahertz network over a 2.4 gigahertz network as a roaming candidate if the candidate network in 5 gigahertz measures an RSSI of negative 68 or greater. All right, so to your question, what's missing from this? Yes, 6E, thank you. Um, the Apple articles have not been updated to reflect 6E. Um, and so I am drawing a certain number of assumptions based on previous behavior um, that have been borne out in the limited testing that I have done. Um, but what I am showing you is what Apple actually documents and then calling out some things that Apple doesn't document. Apple does not indicate a preference around 6E if 6E is available or if the client device supports 6E at this time. Right now, all Apple's calling out is that it prefers, macOS will prefer 5 gigahertz network um, given a certain RSSI threshold. Is this working? Anyway. Um, it, when you say greater than negative 68, it would be like <laughs> negative 67 or higher. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, because that, because that and that is true of the way that we use these logarithmic figures. A smaller negative integer represents a higher signal strength. I think I said that right. Um, so yes, absolutely. Let's have that back. Excellent point. Okay. Criteria number two, and this is interesting because this is a new insertion. I believe, although I have not confirmed that this is a new insertion since macOS Ventura shipped. Um, this was not in the article the last time I reviewed this particular process. Um, macOS considers information shared by networks about channel utilization and quantity of associated clients. macOS uses these details along with signal strength measurements to score candidate networks. Higher scored networks offer a better Wi-Fi experience. If multiple 5 gigahertz SSIDs receive the same score, macOS chooses a network based on these criteria. So then what we have is we have, in our third and fourth steps, we have a fairly straightforward prioritization of connection based on generation of Wi-Fi 
and expected performance of the network based on channel width. We prefer connections that are 802.11ax, that is Wi-Fi 6, over AC, Wi-Fi 5, and we prefer AC, Wi-Fi 5, over 802.11n, Wi-Fi 4. We prefer 80 megahertz channels over 40 megahertz channels, and we prefer 40 megahertz channels over 20 megahertz channels. And then we select a new candidate AP or BSS, basic service set, that has an RSSI at least 12 decibels higher than the client's current RSSI. Are we all clear on that? <laughs> yeah, it's written down. This is essentially just a reproduction of Apple's criteria list, so you'd, you don't even necessarily need to write it down. It's right there in the KBase article. Um, now, a couple of things. There's no discussion of 6 gigahertz, Wi-Fi 6E. There's also no discussion of how rule number five, the desire to have a connection 12 dB higher, affects rule number two, um, the selection of a possible Rome candidate based on information from the access point. So that, and that again was a new addition in this last round of documentation. If you find it, please let me know. I hope to find it myself someday. Um, what I think here is that based on Apple's previous behavior, um, 6 gigahertz is going to be preferred over 5 gigahertz if available and supported. That's a supposition on my part, but Apple's behavior so far has essentially been higher performance better go to that. Um, whether rule five affects rule number two, I have no idea, and I think that that would probably be borne out more by conversations and testing than anything else. And so here's what the whole hierarchy looks like in a single slide. Um, I just didn't want to have this up here because I, had, I'm, I, I fight very hard against the wall of text slide issue. Um, this is the same thing you've already seen. Moving on to iOS, we find that we have a different roaming trigger. Negative 70 RSSI is our roaming trigger for iOS and iPad OS, so it's a different reading. Um, and then the selection criteria list is very similar, but again, slightly different. We've got a little bit of a different behavior. If the candidate BSS's RSSI is greater than negative 65, the device prefers the 5 gigahertz network. I think, did we say 68 before? What did we say before? Oh, let's see. Yep, negative 68 for Mac. Negative 65 is where we want to go um, in order to prefer a 5 gigahertz network for iOS and iPadOS. Have exactly the same statement in number two about iOS and iPadOS roaming. Um, iOS considers information shared by networks about channel utilization, and quantity of associated clients, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have a very similar hierarchy for how we choose um, what our can which candidate we want to roam to, AX over AC, AC over N, 80 megahertz channels over 40 megahertz channels, 40s over 20. Um, and then things get a little strange. The next question that iOS asks is, what's the current state of my device vis-a-vis -vis transmitting data? Am I sending data right now while I'm trying to select a Rome candidate, or am I not sending data right now while I select a Rome candidate, while I try to select a Rome candidate? If I'm sending data, pick a target candidate whose RSSI is eight decibels greater than current, but if I'm not sending data, try to find one whose target strength is 12 dB higher than current. Essentially, the way that I read this is Apple saying that if something's in the middle of transmitting and receiving, it's more important to complete the roam successfully, even if the connection isn't quite as good, so we're willing to accept a slightly weaker connection. If we're not sending data, let's be a little bit more conservative and wait until we find something that's really strong so we don't have to do this again in a minute. Um, again, we have no discussion of 6 gigahertz. Uh, we don't know how Rule 5 interacts with Rule 2. If you came to my talk about 6E yesterday, um, at this point, the iPad Pro is the only iOS device that supports 
uh, Wi-Fi 6E, so this probably isn't a salient question yet. Um, you know, I have no information, um, but I can imagine sometime this fall that the question of 6E support might grow a little bit more salient with potential new product introductions that happen every year. We'll see. Again, a summary um, of the iOS and iPad roaming process. And let's take a stop for questions. All right. I got, I got one. All right. Um, how many, oh, there it is. How many of the networks in the roam list does it go does it go to all of them before it tries to do the roam or does it stop on the first one that meets the criteria uh, that's a good question i don't know the answer to that i think the the way that i read the article is that it's doing a full iteration of the list of candidates that it has and then it's deciding among the candidates that it has based on these criteria i do not know though and i don't think that I would suggest that that's documented anywhere because I think that that's it's a it's a very good detail question, but it seems a little bit too between the lines of what we've been given to really offer a hard and fast answer. I I also had one that went back where you were talking about one slow client can affect yep. all the entire network. Is that only per radio or is that per SSID? That's going to be per. Um, BSSID, and by B basic service set is a subset of an SSID associated with a single radio and an access point. So technically, a basic service set is going to be the cell broadcast on a particular band by a particular radio by one access point. So if you have a tri-band access point, if you have an access point that's broadcasting 2.4, 5, and 6, that access point may, if, if it's only broadcasting one SSID, um, that access point is broadcasting three BSSIDs, one SSID per band. What, what about MIMO technology? I mean, with multiple radios or multiple antennas? Um, I think that that's not really relevant to this question in terms of, of thinking that the MIMO technology is more of a kind of this is how I'm transmitting for redundancy and resiliency, and I, I would okay. suggest that it doesn't really enter into this particular discussion. You have a second SSID on the same access point, you add three more BSSIDs. So it's a very odd little concept. It's a concept, it's a, it's a combination of the SSID and the radio in a particular access point. Um, so you see an access point that's broadcasting something like six networks, so that thing's going to have 18 b uh, basic service sets. So on to advanced roaming technologies and it, oh, oh, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> Not too bad. So looking at the different criteria between the Mac and an iOS device, can we make inferences about their, their willingness to roam based on their perceived mobility? Like the iOS device is, a more, is perceived to be a more mobile device, and so therefore it would be more willing to roam to find better service? Based I, on the numbers? In short, I think the answer is yes, and we're going to see some stuff on that. So okay. we're going to see some kind of information about kind of perception and um, the way that client devices view networks. Uh, we, uh, can we get let's, that back yeah, up let's here? Relay this thing. Yeah. All right, so 802.11 alphabet soup. Uh, Apple has another um, K-Base article that's separate called Wi-Fi Network Roaming with 802.11K, 802.11R, and 802.11V on iOS, iPadOS, and macOS. And this article describes in brief a lot of what I'm about to talk about on a per, what these are called is these are amendments to the 802.11 standard that describe specific functions that have been tacked onto the general 802.11 standard. So first of all, we have 802.11K 2008, 
Um, it is an amendment to handle um, radio resource management of wireless lands. Of particular interest to us is a concept called neighbor reports. Um, a neighbor report is a list of access points collected by an access point. And it's a list of the access points that are near the access point doing the collection that is provided to clients upon a separate request. Essentially what we have is we, we have APs maintaining a list and then a client as it prepares to roam can make a request and say, hey, do you have a list of your neighbors? Um, and this allows clients to skip an explicit network scan um, to find more roam candidates, thus speeding up the process of making a decision, evaluating the network. You can see this, it shows up in the beacon frame um, in an access point's beacon broadcast um, to say that something like reduced neighbor reports are available. You don't actually see the content of the neighbor report to answer that question. You just see that the access point is capable of supporting it. Second up, we've got something called Fast Basic Service Set Transition, uh, 802.11r. And the way that this helps us it is allows caching of authentication keys to access points so that access points can skip the process of full reauthentication when they roam. This is especially important in enterprise networks where you're using 802.1x um, to perform very heavy duty authentication. Uh, Apple's documentation indicates that it works with both 802.11x um, and Pre-shared key networking devices, um, I don't have enough experience to say one way or the other, but you can benefit whether you're using um, advanced authentication or not. Now on to 802.11v, 2011, Wireless Network Management, and what's called BSS Transition Management, Disassociation Imminent. It's the third amendment that we care about. Um, and what it does is provide information to the clients about the access points themselves and their load in terms of how busy they are, how many clients that they have associated. Um, does this sound a little bit familiar from kind of our roaming candidate selection process? This sounds a lot like what Apple's describing in their documents, but I could assume and I can speculate, but I can't confirm because I'm not 100% sure. But this, this sounds an awful lot like it fits the profile, as they say. And then finally, we have this thing that Apple documents called pairwise master key identifier caching, which is part of 802.11i. And it's something that gets kind of shoved aside in everyone's discussion. And from what I can read is that it's a little bit older it's a little bit of an older method of caching information at other access points. And it's uh, something that if you, if you do a search and include the word security, there have been a lot of security holes on this. So it seems to be the case that, particularly if you're using a pre-shared key network, you don't want to be doing this. But Apple also documents it. And so when you get into these advanced roaming amendments, um, you then want to know um, how does Apple handle these advanced roaming amendments? And the answer is different from Mac OS, um, in dif different in Mac OS and iOS, and it's subdivided in Mac OS. When we talked about this in 2000, did, did Apple Silicon exist in 2019, at least publicly when we talked about this? I don't think it did. And so this is one of those questions where in 2019 we were looking at the documentation and Apple's platform deployment guides would say things like, oh, hey, this works great in iOS. And then there's no mention of it in Mac OS. Um, now it's mentioned, and essentially what Apple's chosen to do is they've provided support in Apple Silicon devices, specific Apple Silicon devices. They need to be running Mac OS Monterey or better. Um, and they're just kind of waiting for Intel devices to age out. Um, how many people are more than 50% Apple Silicon now in your fleet? How many people think it's going to take you more than two or three more years to age Intel out of your fleet? 
Okay, a few folks. So this is something that you're gonna wanna watch out for. This is something that the longer time goes on, the less angry we have to be about this, but it is something to be aware of. With respect to iOS and iPadOS advanced roaming support, Apple provides sort of a different set of criteria rather than being based on any kind of hardware platform, it's based on iOS version. Um, you can see kind of the interesting note there at the end for PK, PMKID caching where Apple just says yes, it's supported <laughs> without really designating what version of iOS you're working with. Apple describes a minimum iOS version. Um, I suppose the good news here is that if you're still on a version of iOS that doesn't support these amendments, you have many, many, many other problems and roaming ain't one, as they say. <laughs> you know, and all of this illustrates that questions of client support underline a key concept in this discussion, which is that using these amendments comes with a number of important caveats, and there's several of those. Your clients have to support the amendments. Your networks have to support the amendments. You're usually gonna go to your client vendor and consult their documentation and say, hey, what's supported here? If you really want to, you can dig into packet captures and see what clients say they support because that information is all communicated back and forth between the clients on the network when they go to, to join the network. Um, if you're looking for information about network support, you can either talk to your network team or again, you can use the fantastic Wi-Fi Explorer in its column um, amendments that shows what amendments it has detected as enabled on your access points, um, saving you a lot of work. And then there's one final key thing about these advanced roaming amendments, and this is the thing that I think people get really excited about these advanced roaming amendments, they get really excited about these capabilities. Not one of these changes your Apple device roaming trigger thresholds. And that's a key point because these advanced roaming amendments are all things that are there to help the client along when it's decided to roam. If it hasn't decided to roam yet, well, yeah, the negative 75 um, dBm and negative 70 dBm um, thresholds are still key for macOS and iOS questions about that. Obscene gestures? Okay. Um, so now let's talk about some sharp corners and this is where the conversation will really start to go into the weeds and it looks like I, I might have to hurry myself up a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk about things that can get, in, get you into trouble when thinking about roaming and there's four broad categories here. One is issues with the roaming selection criteria. Two, we're gonna get into the implications of some physics and math and yes, we're gonna see some physics and math. Um, we're going to talk about differentiation of client devices, um, and that's going to include some visual aids that kind of illustrate some of the issues that I'm talking about. So, um, to get into kind of roaming selection criteria, there's a lot of rules, right? And if we go back over this rule list and start asking ourselves some questions about the rules, um, you know, what happens if there's no five gigahertz network with a signal strength of ne negative 68 or better? In this case, we're probably gonna end up switching to 2.4 gigahertz, and that generates its own problems because in an improperly tuned network, a 2.4 gigahertz network is gonna attenuate less readily, and this is a place where your client may stick. This is a point at which you may be just be telling your end user, turn Wi-Fi off, turn it back on, in order to get back on five gigahertz, and hopefully it will. In terms of the preference hierarchy of Wi-Fi technologies, that is what we call the Fi modes, um, we know that we prefer AX over AC and AC over N. What happens if you have a network that's grown organically and you've slapped a mixture of APs into place that use different technologies? This is gonna be true of smaller growing companies in a lot of cases. All of a sudden you've got a mixture of possible candidates to roam to and the behavior of the client is gonna become very unpredictable. 
You have a similar issue with channel widths. One of the things that vendors love to do is they love to set default channel widths, and sometimes they change the default channel widths on a model-by-model -model basis. And if you're not carefully monitoring what your widths are, you might have a mixture and get yourself into trouble. And then finally, what happens if a, um, a Rome candidate with a signal strength at least 12 dB higher isn't available? Usually, yeah. So, some physics and math. And um, I'll concede that I have a degree in American history, so this is where my brain starts to bend and where some of these explanations may be a little bit awkward. Um, start with the inverse square law, which is a basic law of um, physics that says that the intensity of signal from a point source, say an access point, or you can think of a light bulb as the same, as the same kind of thing, um, it's inversely proportional, proportional to the square of the distance from the point source. To put more simply, you travel away from a point source, the intensity of a signal drops in a way that you can calculate and model. Using an example from astronomy, the further you get away from the sun, the dimmer it is. The key implication of this inverse square law is that the numbers we use to describe power and signal in Wi-Fi grow and shrink by orders of magnitude, and they do it very rapidly. Um, radios use electricity to generate a signal. We measure and describe the intensity of that signal using units of watts and milliwatts. However, you can see that when you get into decimal conversions, it's easy to misplace a zero, it's easy to misplace a period. And so what we've done in the industry is we have, for ease of use, converted our measurement system to a logarithmic system that uses the unit of decibel milliwatt. And what that allows is for us to describe our increases and decreases in signal strength and power output in a decibel scale. Um, oh, it, not just a decibel scale, but just a simple integer scale. Up one, up two, up three, down six, that kind of thing. Um, and that leads us to what we call the rule of three and ten, which is an implication of this decibel scale um, that we all use as shorthand in Wi-Fi, where if we have a three decibel increase, we understand that to be a doubling of signal intensity. Conversely, we have a three decibel decrease, we have our signal intensity, or we understand we halved our signal intensity. And by a similar token, a 10 decibel increase and a 10 decibel decrease essentially increase or decrease the signal intensity by a factor of 10. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So we start to recast our language and arrive at what we also call the six decibel rule. Um, and what we're basically saying that with the six decibel rule is that if you decrease output power by 6 dB, you're essentially having your range. You increase it by 6 dB, you're doubling your range. More accurately, you are doubling or having your signal intensity at a defined point. Um, restating the inverse square law, doubling the distance from your transmission source quarters the signal strength. And our logarithmic scale represents that as a loss of six decibels. And the reason that I'm emphasizing this is that we're going to get into a very specific visual example that depends on it. Um, we can take this set of conversions to decibels and we can take these mathematical rules and we can apply some assumptions that are kind of built into the Wi-Fi industry and we can predict based on a starting standard output from an access point what our RSSI might be at a given distance. And this is where things get, this is where the fun begins. Um, so let's apply this. Um, and we're going to talk about negative 67 decibel milliwatts versus negative 75 decibel milliwatts. Because negative 67 decibel milliwatts is a threshold that a lot of vendors for network products in the Wi-Fi industry, voice over IP phones, barcode scanners, things like that, this is what vendors tend to recommend you use as your cell edge. 
you know, the limit of your cell where you should have another cell. Um, and then we're talking about NEG75 as our roaming tr threshold trigger for our Mac OS. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set um, a MacBook at four meters from an access point, and its RSSI is gonna read as NEG49 dBm. Uh, we're just starting with that as an assumption, and then we're gonna use that math to move. Remember, every time we double our distance, we drop negative six. So at eight meters, we expect to read negative 55 RSSI. At 16 meters, we expect to read negative 61. And at 32 meters, we expect to read negative 67. And this is a bit of an artificial example, but it serves to illustrate kind of the doubling effect and the signal drop. And so 32 meters is, in American, 100 feet? So you're 100 feet away from the access point in this particular scenario in open space without having reached the threshold for roaming on a Mac. Question is, how far do you have to go? Double again to 64 meters in this particular example, um, and you're gonna hit negative 73. You're still not there. You go to the internet and you plug in the math um, and you let it give you the answer for you because you don't know how to do the math well enough and you arrive at an answer of, neg of 82 meters to hit negative 75. And there's a lot of caveats to this example. This example it assumes open space. It assumes a lot about the sensitivity um, of the antennas involved. But what you want to be thinking about, really, is the difference between that negative 67 dBm cell edge and what it takes to get to negative 75 in the scale. You know, it's something like two and a half times the distance to get to neg 67. And no matter how much you jump your power out down, up and down on your access point to increase or decrease the transmission strength, that mathematical multiple is still going to be there. And so you want to know why it takes a long time to hit negative 75 in Rome? The answer is math. Well, actually, that's not true. The answer is choices and math. Negative 75 is a choice. Physical laws and math have an implication. Another way that I like to illustrate this is I like to illustrate this with what's called um, my FIFA pitch demonstration. I uh, found a diagram of a soccer pitch, international soccer pitch. Um, I scaled it to, I think, 110 meters along the length, which seems to be within the context of regulation. And then I take a Cisco 9164 access point, I turn the power way down on it, and I drop it in the middle of the soccer pitch. Um, the green area represents the area where the signal strength is negative 67 or greater. Uh, gray is weaker than that. So this is where we find the cell edges defined by a lot of the vendors. How much do you think, uh, how much of the, this football pitch do you think um, you have to pass over in order to get to negative 75? Or, what's that? Lots. Lots. The answer is lots. Um, so you can see that in open space, the differentiation between this negative 67 and this negative 75 represents a substantial distance and a substantial area that at least the Mac considers valid for coverage based on our SSI. Um, with, and I think to, to, to quasi answer one of the other questions we had, with, um, iOS devices and the different roaming trigger threshold in negative 70, this is going to look different, which is going to create its own complications. I don't have a visual for this um, because I decided that might take a little bit too much time. So we're just going to kind of set the issues of this mathematics aside for a moment, and then we're going to talk about client device capabilities because clients are different and interpret signal levels differently. I sat at my dining room table. I threw down five devices that I had easily available. I have two access points in my townhouse. I live in a three-story townhouse that's something like 16 feet wide um, in the city of Seattle. So in order to effectively cover my house, I actually need two access points because of the way that it's designed. Um, 
different devices read different signal levels and they're going to hit their roaming thresholds at different times. And this is going to play into a bunch of choices that you have to make when we get to the stage of designing a network and understanding why roaming is troublesome. Why are there discrepancies? Different chipsets, different radios, different antenna designs, the way that I'm holding my phone close to my body whereas the laptop is sitting on the dining room table, there are all sorts of things that go into this. And you can have multiple devices the same distance read from the same access point reading different RSSI levels and this is all going to enter into roaming. Um, one thing that I've encountered recently that's interesting is you might also encounter different technical capabilities in client chipsets. You might find client chipsets um, that don't support certain channels. I was reading Wikipedia's article on WLAN channels a couple of days ago and came across the surprising fact that the FCC had opened up channels 167 through 177 in the 5 gigahertz band in January. To yeah, see? I, I had the same reaction. I was like, really? I had no idea. Because the ability to support these channels and these frequencies is essentially burned into the silicon of the chipset. And so certain devices won't support certain channels. I mean, sometimes you get a, a device developer whose chipsets are kind of built with the possible expansion in mind, and then eventually drivers can be updated and support new things. Um, Apple is usually is, is very, very good about this. Apple has typically supported all of the available channels in the 5 gigahertz band. This issue of 167 through 177 was new for me. I haven't seen a lot of access points supporting it either, so I assume it's kind of a null issue in terms of your day to day. Um, but it's there. It's a potential problem. Um, you get a newer set of access points that have channels that your clients don't support, you get yourself in trouble here. So that was a lot. Questions? OK, so it, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, it, it would seem like it would make sense for Apple, at least, to have the same thresholds on different devices. To have, um, it, I'm sorry, so to have what? The same roaming thresholds on different devices. It would make sense for them, you would think. So have they spoken publicly or documented any reason why that would be different? No, all we can, all we can do is speculate and kind of surmise. Um, I think that for my part, if you ask me to speculate and surmise, the way that I think about it is that Apple thinks of the iPad and the iPhone as devices that are likely to be, they think of the iPad and the iPhone as truly mobile devices. Is my, is my take on it, that are the devices that are being carried around, actively being used while the user is on the move, and therefore the way, and with, with smaller, less sensitive antennas and less powerful transmitters, they feel like they need um, a more aggressive threshold to trigger a roam on those. And the impression that I've had is that they simply don't think of laptops, MacBook Pros, MacBook Airs in the same way. Um, in spite of all of the people that you have that you work with who walk from office to office on a Zoom call with the lid open, that's just not Apple, how Apple thinks of it from a design perspective. That's my take on it. There's no real hard information behind that. Um, I can definitely say that um, I've provided that feedback and a number of other folks that I work with have provided that feedback as well. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, a quick follow-up, is that commonplace for other vendors as well? Do we, do we know? I don't know um, specifically. I, ha I spend most of my time with Apple devices and I haven't spent a lot of time investigating the way that other vendors um, treat it. Uh, Apple's unique in kind of that sense that they control the hardware and the driver and the configuration in a way that a lot of other vendors don't. And I suspect that the answer with other vendors is probably a lot more of a mishmash. Yeah. That's a different <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another complicated follow up. Okay. If so, you gave the distance calculations, you gave all of that. 
I'm in, I, I'm at a trigger point for a room. My, my device looks for something. There's no candidate. I'm still moving. When is the next trigger? Good question. <laughs> so um, there are some things we just don't know. And let me come back to that at the end because I want to make sure I understood the question. Okay. But um, let's talk about I wanted to get to this while we still had some time because this is the thing that I didn't really get to spend time on the last time I gave this talk. <laughs> Recommendations um, dealing with Wi-Fi roaming and its discontents. So. Your first goal is setting expectations, not panicking. Remember to bring a towel. Um, <laughs> set your expectations based on all of these caveats and limitations that you've learned about, and also based on testing that you've done. Um, based on what you know, you may have the option to tailor your network for a Mac OS device, but you also may need to tailor it for an iOS device instead, which is something we'll talk about when we talk about design. Um, one thing that I tend to find is that a Mac will continue working reasonably well in a lot of situations, even if the RSSI falls um, to what we would normally think of as a relatively low threshold. That might not be a terribly satisfactory index, but this is me walking out into the courtyard of my building, um, getting a certain distance and maintaining a ping to my router. The latency goes up and down a little bit, um, but I, have, I continue to have negotiated, what speed is that? 80 megabits, 86 megabit network connection, it's enough for a Zoom call. Um, Zoom call requires, I think, four megabits, three megabits for something like a single screen call. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a, first of all, is it really necessary? And second of all, since it's so hard, should we just set our expectations that, um, it, particularly for Macs, roaming may continue to be problematic for us? Um, second recommendation is that you want to have a clear understanding of all of these limitations and goals. Um, because of the way that Wi-Fi works, that is, you've got a single radio for each band, and you have all of these different devices with different performance levels and different sensitivities, your design opportunity gives you the op opportunity to optimize for one type of device. Oftentimes in the industry, we call this the LCMI, the least capable, most important device. Typically, it's whatever the C-levels are carrying. Um, other devices are going to have connections that are at variance with the connection quality um, of that least capable, most important device. In particular, if you design a network to provide um, appropriate signal level for an iPhone, um, what you may find is that um, your MacBook Pros end up viewing that network as possibly more crowded with access points than the iPhones do, and so you end up with that tendency towards stickiness. Um, it's possible that I need to strike that and reverse it and make sure I'm thinking it the way through, but the idea remains the same, that you design for one device, performance behavior on another device is different, and you need to kind of document and prepare for that. Um, you need to involve your key people in the design process. They're the ones who know what the most important devices are. In another section of your network, if you have a logistics team, you may have warehouses that are using um, wireless barcode scanners to do inventory, and those are the least capable and most important devices for that particular portion of your network. This becomes a very detail-oriented process, and it's a process, and this is one of the reasons I think that um, network folks um, you know, get a little bit on edge, because just walking in with a new device may change the whole design requirement for your network, because it's a new device and it has new characteristics. And they've invested a lot of time in that network. And there's our ROI replacement cycle on that that's seven years. They don't get to do it again for seven years or five years or what have you. Um, you'll also be aware of people's unstated assumptions, the assumption that they can just walk in and then write everything down and get everybody to sign off on it. Um, I'm not a big fan of paper trail for blame, but I'm a big fan of paper trail for understanding what we were thinking. Again, history degree. 
Um, understand your client fleet. Again, we come back to the least capable, most important device. Um, tailor your design to the least capable, most important device. Um, how are you going to know what that is? You're going to talk to the people who make the decisions. You're going to talk to the people who are using the devices. You're going to talk to the people who are doing the work. You're going to talk, talk, talk. You're going to document, document, document. You're going to write everything down, get everybody to sign off on it. And then design is key when you're doing this. Decide what frequency band you're designing for. And it's probably going to be 5 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz at this point. 5 gigahertz for the foreseeable future with 6 gigahertz as a supplement um, until you get to the point where you can claim that the bulk of your fleet is 6 gigahertz compatible. Um, you want to take advantage of signal propagation and attenuation characteristics. What I mean by that is most of the examples we've shown have involved open space. There's no assumption that you have walls in place to cut down on the signal level. Different types of construction materials will attenuate signal, that is, reduce its intensity as the signal passes through those materials. And you can take advantage of that in your design if you place your access points properly so that particular walls are cutting off the signal in order to encourage client devices to roam by reducing their RSSI. Um, that's an incredibly valuable thing to do. It's also a very good reason why if you're an educational institution or even um, a business with offices, you should not be placing access points in the hallways because access points in the hallways will be broadcasting into free space and that signal will not attenuate as readily. Oh, you do want to avoid using 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi wherever possible. Um, it's a crowded spectrum. You only have three channels. Um, the performance is low. Um, it's easy to overcrowd and create contention. And it's easy to get into a situation where your client machines are roaming to 2.4, establishing a low connection, and then not letting go. Sticky, again. Um, if you have to use 2.4 gigahertz, um, consider using a separate SSID in the 2.4 gigahertz band. And yes, that does contradict the KBase article that I discussed yesterday about 6E networks that Apple published that says our recommendation is that your SSID be named the same thing in all three bands. How we're going to resolve that, I'm not entirely sure. This may, um, this is a discussion that I had with John yesterday, um, suggesting that possibly part of this had to do with IoT and HomeKit type of stuff, uh, which I don't know the answer to. I haven't confirmed that. It's possible we bifurcate our recommendations according to enterprise and home environments. Um, and then if you really want to get extreme, one thing that you can do if you, if you think to, um, the way that access points are designed, most of them are designed with omnidirectional antennas. Essentially, their broadcast pattern is analogous to that of an incandescent light bulb. They broadcast <laughs> approximately the same strength in you know, a, sphere, a semi-spherical um, or a donut-style direction. Um, if you really want to get aggressive about this, you can start to play around with hardware design changes along the lines of access points that take external directional antennas to focus your signal the way that perhaps a flashlight does. And you can focus sig a signal on a smaller portion of your facility. And what that implicitly does is cause the RSSI deg to degrade over a much shorter distance because you're more focused on a single location. That is something that really gets into your budget, though. Um, but it is something that you see done for environments like performance halls. You see it done for environments like warehouses. You see it done for, in, in some cases, for environments like sports venues, et cetera, et cetera, when you really have to get aggressive about constraining your cell size. And then finally, we're going to implement in detail. Um, there are a lot of little options that may or may not help. Um, I have to say that if you are deploying all your access points and setting them to maximum transmission power, you are hurting yourself. 
Um, most access points want to be tuned to half the potential power or less, particularly for indoor and open off in, in open office environments, even less. You may want to set your transmit power for your access points at something like 3 dBm or 4 dBm if you have an open floor plan office because you really want to do everything you can to reduce that cell size. You want to serve a much smaller area because again, that signal will just propagate and propagate and propagate. Um, you can try disabling lower bit rates on your network. Um, that is make it possible or make it so that it's impossible for clients to associate and transmit at the lowest possible data rates. Um, I'm not particularly convinced that that works based on what I've seen. Um, I still feel like at negative 74, um, negative 73, I still see 80, 100 megabit bit rates and the types of um, disabling we do is disabling everything up to say 24. And that's, a, that's an interesting conversation. There's no reason not to do it, but I'm not sure what it gains us at this point. Um, you do want to implement the advanced roaming features wherever you can, not necessarily because it helps trigger the roam, but because it helps make the roam faster. Um, and then you might want to watch out for features that might cause problems in your network infrastructure. A very good example of this is um, radio load balancing, where a network will try to intelligently split the load of clients across um, different radios in order to keep the load relatively stable across all of your access points. That may prevent your client devices from roaming, or worse, it may allow your client device to roam and then cause your device to roam right back. Then train your users accordingly. You may not want to set the expectation that they're going to roam reliably on a Mac. You may want to set that expectation that, you know, the thing you do is you just disconnect and reconnect. That might ultimately be a source of less frustration in a lot of ways. You, know, you might just get to the point where you receive fewer help desk calls if you, if you define your expectations down for this particular issue. A lot of that's going to depend on how important it is to your particular business, right? And again, I can't emphasize this enough, set your expectations. Set your expectations appropriately for this. Because I think that, that one of the things that I find in my discussions in the various network and Wi-Fi channels is kind of an expectation that, you know, this is going to work the way that I want it to and I can force this to happen. There's a lot you can do to encourage it if you spend the appropriate amount of time on design and implementation. You can get this closer to where it is out of the, then closer, to, to where you want it than where it is out of the box. But because of this kind of discrepancy between roaming thresholds and what a lot of folks seem to want based on their expectations, I don't feel comfortable guaranteeing that you're going to be able to pull this off 100% of the time. Questions? I got three minutes. <laughs> what did we lose? Just, just a little bit of liquid there. Sorry about that. Uh, I think it was just water. Okay, so catch box, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned channel widths. Uh, is there a recommendation on channel widths in the, in the general area? Um, should they be all the same? Because I, I hear different things on channel widths. Well, so channel widths is something that it, it, it doesn't really enter into the roaming discussion. Um, and so it's a little out of scope for this conversation, but in general, the answer is, and there's, a, there's a, somebody who's very prominent in the Wi-Fi community named Samuel Clements, uh, who's done a lot of work with Cisco, a lot of work with Meraki, worked for some of the major resellers. Um, his answer to almost every question is it depends. Um, we've got somebody, Greg Nagel, in our community whose um, default question is what are you trying to accomplish? And so, the short answer is, is that at least in the five gigahertz band, if you have wider channels, you have fewer of them available to you. And higher likelihood that those channels will overlap and create contention. That is, if I have an access point 
on channel 40 here and an access point on channel 40 here and a laptop in the middle that can hear both of them, that laptop has to wait until traffic is clear from both of those access points to transmit because you've reduced the number of channels that you have available um, that are independent. So a lot of the time the, the default answer in the five gigahertz band is that what you really want to do is you really want to shoot for spectral efficiency or channel efficiency that ha is have as much possible reuse of existing channels as possible to reduce that amount of contention. And so by that argument, um, I'm fairly well known to yell at people for you don't really need 80 megahertz channels because your Zoom call only takes four megabyte, megabits of throughput, you should be, especially in an urban environment, a dense environment, um, environment where you have three foot desks packed together for a call center, that type of thing, you want as many non-overlapping channels as possible. And so 20 megahertz. Um, in other scenarios, you might want to be able to push as much data as possible as quickly as possible. So 80 megahertz, but you should be cabling those devices to ethernet. Zero seconds and we're done. <laughs> Happy to continue taking questions, but our time is up. Um, anybody else got anything while we're waiting? In neither of your sessions did you mention anything about mesh. How does uh, Painfully. Painfully. Um, 